talking about today, as probably everybody participating knows, is probably the biggest thing that's hit the world uh, since the Second World War. Uh, <clears throat> and I think all the thing, a lot of the things uh, that Dick was talking about, all the big issues of the day, I think they'll all go up in the air. I don't think we're going to have the same uh, politics a year from now as we do now. And the secret of that, of course, is this awful pandemic and the terrible government, the bad luck that we've had to have a really appallingly stupid government in power when, when it hit us. So we are uh, probably have the highest death rate uh, per population in the world. Uh, there's some debate, but it's not a debate it's nice to be in. Um, the current proposals that they're working on to get us out of this are, are inadequate. Um, and it, it, it is not difficult in a way to see how to get out of it. And in fact, anybody who's interested, we're very lucky. The government has a group that they call SAGE, which has stands for something which I can't remember. Uh, and they're supposed to advise the government. They're all top-notch kind of professional uh, in their field. Uh, but they are tied into the establishment. They're tied into the government and they have not been independent enough. And we've been very lucky that a group of people equally prominent, maybe more prominent in the fields, uh, has formed themselves as independent sage. And you can look up independent sage and you will really get, a, you know, find the, all the stuff from top notch people. And I'm cribbing a lot of their stuff. The crucial bit, of course, is how do we stop killing people with this virus? Um, and the answer is, we know, the way that you stop people getting the virus is you reduce their contact with each other. In the, in the most extreme form, that's a complete shutdown. Nobody goes out of their house and you will cure it. You will get it. But if you want to get it in a less drastic way, what you have to do is find the people who have the virus, check the people who've been in contact with them, isolate both for the two weeks or so that it takes to get over this, to stop being infectious. And that's, it, it's got a, a, an, acronym, an acronym which doesn't make any sense at all as an acronym. It's, it's find, uh, test, trace, isolate, support. So if you know those letters, you'll you'll get it all right. But we have to find the people. Now, what the government has done, instead of building on the experience and expertise of the public people who we already have in public health, in social care, in the NHS, they decided that they didn't really want to have anything to do with people who work for governments. Governments are not their business. They're the government, but governments, as they know, are useless. So they went to their expert friends in Serco and so on, who made a billions of pounds out of the government uh, and made tremendous messes and scandals on, on the way. So they had a system, not very well organized because it's been chopped around by the previous uh, Tory government, but nonetheless the basis of, of a system there, and they went completely outside it and set up a parallel system based on Serco and a couple of other organizations of equal repute. So if you want to, and they set it up, of course, on a national level, because you don't want to really dirty your hands getting down to talking back to real people. So they've got uh, call centers. So they all, you could talk to anybody anywhere in the country. You don't need to be a counselor or a, or a, or a GP or, or a social worker or anything to know people locally and to know what the issues are and where to find them. No, you can find that out by a, a protocol and you can hire somebody off the street uh, to do it. So that's what they did. And they had the success that you would expect. Uh, so we're not finding the people. Now the current situation is that the, got the sage, the sage themselves said that you have to find 80% of contacts of people in, uh, uh, who've been in contact with people with, with the virus and isolate them and then you and then you will bring it to a, a halt that that number you don't need to get to 100 percent 80 percent will 
other people, there's been a very big mathematical project just now that said it might be 67%. Unfortunately, the government, i.e. Serco, has not gotten past 50%. So we're heading to complete disaster. Uh, there is an obvious solution, um, and that solution is to go and do what they should have done in the first place. You go to the people who know, but we have a public health system, as I said, chopped about, but full of experienced, trained people whose job it is to deal with epidemics. And the great thing about epidemics, if there is anything great about epidemics, is that people have known, or pandemics, is that the protocol for how you deal with it has been known for at least 100 years. And we've had uh, uh, some successes, many successes along the line of limiting pandemics. Uh, and, and the crucial bit is, is just what I've been saying, this business of finding the people and getting them out of circulation until they're, it's not a very long period, two weeks, but you have to do it. Um, and so the, the solution is quite simple. Go to the uh, local authorities, go to the NHS, go to the GPs, go to the public health uh, service and allow them to set up local systems to find the people using all the information, all the contacts they have. And we have with, with our counselors and people who want to be counselors, people who are in contact with dozens of organizations and hundreds of people and know an enormous amount. We could get to find out what the schools are seeing. They will be seeing evidence one way or another in the children uh, and so on. And then, and once you've done that, then you test the people because you don't want to uh, interrupt people's lives who don't have the disease, so you test them. Uh, and then you go on to very carefully find the, the people they've been in contact with. And it requires a bit more than somebody off the street in a, in a, in a call center because it takes a certain amount of nows, how to talk to people. People don't always want to be uh, questioned about their whereabouts and who the people they've been in contact with. You have to have those skills, but they're not the great, you know, they're not all that uh, uh, unavailable. And so, and if you do that, the next thing you have to do is you have to spend a bit of money because lots of people do not have the money to easily take two weeks out of their work and be isolated. And, but you, so you pay them. When we're dealing with a pandemic, which is destroying the economy at the rate of, I don't know how many tens of billions a month, to spend the money that you can pay enough money so somebody can comfortably take the time out is not a big deal. So we know how to do it. Uh, the protocols are there. I think the people are there. It would take some time. It, it's a big project. When they started this in Wuhan in China where the pandemic first emerged, uh, they hired, I think, 9,000 people for a province of 11 million people. So about one for every 1,200 people. In Oxfordshire, uh, that's about uh, 650 people. A big deal, but not a big deal. Uh, and they go door to door and they talk nicely to people and they show them how they can get what they need uh, and, and do their proper job. And people will want to do this. Nobody wants to be uh, infecting their friends and neighbors. Uh, so that's that we could do. Um, the, the next thing though to talk about is we you may have noticed we now have lost 20 over 20 percent of our gross gdp gross disposable product whatever gnp i always get them confused anyhow the pro the production uh, the system of measuring our production economic production which greens usually don't like because it's a stupid measurement because it leaves out lots of things uh, but nonetheless it's the one we've gotten we've lost more 20 percent now, remember, the gross product is two and a half trillion. You're losing a, a year. You're losing 500 billion if it went on for a year. Every month you're losing 40 billion. We could have had a, can you imagine what kind of a health service we could have had and what kind of education system we could have and housing we could have if we weren't squandering it on this uh, pandemic, which incidentally other countries have did who dealt with it in the way I mentioned, did it earlier and are they're not free of it. It, it may be that none of us will ever be free of it, but certainly the extent is minuscule compared to what we're facing. So the next question then is, how are we going to 
get past this economic uh, crisis. The, at the moment, the government is uh, paying something like, uh, I think it's 11 million people, about eight, eight or nine million people who are working for companies who are being, so they call furloughed, the government pays 80% of their salary to the company on the condition that they don't do any work. And you've got another uh, two or three million people in, in uh, their own businesses, small business in the people that it, uh, with a similar system. And you've got about two and a half million people who are unemployed in the traditional way and getting the crummy uh, benefits that they get. So we've got something like uh, 11, 12 million people out of work at the moment. This is, I'm not sure we got that bad in the Great Depression. This is unheard of. We've, it's bad news when you get up to 2 million, 3 million, 5 million, 10 million. We're, we're beyond that. Now the question is, we're now going to have the debate. And unfortunately, the Green Party and the Labour Party and the right wing of the, of the Conservative Party are on, all on the same side, the wrong side. The question of how do we carry on spending so much money? You, we used to get told you couldn't really have a decent health service. You couldn't have uh, well-paid teachers. You couldn't have this and that. You closed, we, they closed our libraries. How can we afford to, to actually employ, with no product, these, these many millions of people? And the government is saying it's coming to the end. October 31st, these finish, these payments finish, and we're not going to renew them. And because the debt, the debt is too great. Now, unfortunately, as I said last year, the Green Party passed a motion at the conference, which I heard about the last minute and spoke against unsuccessfully, which says we worry about terribly about debt. We might go into a bit of debt, but we'd have to clear it in the course of a parliament. That's our idea. The Labour Party has a very similar one, except they were more cunning. They've got get out clauses. We didn't have a get out clause. They had get out clauses which could get you out of anything. So they, so the idea is they can tell everybody, oh, you and we, we worry about debt and deficit. Uh, but on the occasion, if it actually happened, we wouldn't, we found a way out. Uh, so and in, in America, where of course this debt business is a big business, the, the Republican Party, the Conservative American Party, has since Reagan's time realized this was a load of bullshit. This, this accounting thing of that you, you are spending more money than you're taking in in taxes is, is meaningless. It has no significance whatsoever. There are two numbers. You can put them together if you like, but they don't mean anything. Now, before anybody says, oh, you can't spend money indefinitely, things will go bad, the answer is you cannot produce more than you've got the resources for. And the resources, of course, are mainly people, but also the capital, the things we use to make things and do things with. That is true, but that is so far away from our problem. We've got millions of people who are not working. At our best, we have millions of people who are working part-time, out of work, etc. So we've got the enormous resources to deploy the debt is not a point at all. Now, how we get past the, the Green Party and its ad, ad hoc conference motion is like that slip in, I don't know. But I hope people who are better operators than me will figure that out. Um, in the meantime, we're going to be seeing that debate play itself out. And uh, at the moment, Labour is saying, well, we think you should carry on with some of that extra spending, but we are, understand the problem of debt. And uh, the, the chancellor is saying, we, we've just spent too much money. We've got to pull back. We can't keep doing this. So that, that is the big uh, debate. We can do it. But we can do better than just paying people to do nothing. We can move. We can flex ourselves into where the Green Party is very strong, of course. We have things to do. It is not that this country has nothing to do. It's not that we don't need those millions of people to do useful things. We do. We have to re-establish the whole energy system. We have to re-establish the, 
transport system we have to and beyond the things of the green new deal we have to insulate 30 million uh, buildings um, we have to we have to create the actual uh, renewable energy objects so we've got good, good, quite a few things to do and, and we notice that the although we don't like the roads all that much we notice the potholes are not great for anybody and so on so we've got and we've got a few libraries to get back going and a lot of lovely things that we could do we have a national health service to restore to decent uh, staffing and we have a social care system which has been a disaster privatized underfunded disjointed and failing millions of the most vulnerable people in the country so we've got quite a bit to do the green new deal plus what i like to call it, the care new deal uh, and it will cost us a lot of money nothing compared to shutting down your your economy so those are all two of the big things we need to do the the tracing and tracking and isolating properly and i think we can do it why not we've got experts in the field we got the since we don't worry about the money we can hire thousands of people to do the, the legwork and and the nice talking that will be required and we will get past the the shutdowns and then we can put the country to work doing useful things which we've always wanted to do so this is very big if we don't do this if we fail if we if these millions of people now not all those 11 or 12 million people will be out of work but if a, if 30 or 4 percent of them are out of work that's another four or five million to add to the two and a half we've got that would be six or seven million people so it won't be this, this incredible 12 million or whatever that we're supporting who don't work now but it'll be an amount a number again beyond our wildest imagination and those people will be stuck they will be some of them will have no income because we have loads of people falling through all the cracks in this nasty system which is built to be nasty if you're lucky enough to get the money what do you get 80 or 90 pounds a week what's that going to do for people what about rent what about mortgages we are going to have tens and hundreds of thousands of people evicted eventually the, the, the owners will go to the many of them are lovely people but eventually many of them will not will evict people the, the banks will foreclose on people they're all lovely people of course but they will foreclose on people and given the fact that our banking system is essentially a, an arm of the property business not real a real banking system that invests in real things our banks some of our banks are going to go out of business and we know what happened the last time when banks went out of business so we have we will have hunger we will have millions of children in poverty we will have people being pushed out of their homes in the tens and hundreds of thousands we will have chaos and anger and brutality on all sides if we don't and and by we unfortunately we have to mean this government doesn't do its job so that's what i said earlier that the, all the interesting and drastic things that dick is fighting against and looking forward to fighting against uh, may all be dissolved by this disaster that that is looming so we could either use this as an opportunity to rebuild our country in the way that we all know it needs to be both in terms of energy and in terms of care or we can slide into uh, anger and this uh, division that we have not seen in a very long time if ever so it's 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 one of those turning points any questions <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so, so much, Larry, for uh, that talk. Um, and uh, yeah, um, really, really interesting and engaging material. And I think you've covered a huge amount of ground there in terms of like what the the, the, the problems are with regards to the pandemic and the government's response to it and also the kind of challenges that we're facing as a result. And thankfully, we've got lots and lots of questions that have come in specifically on all of those areas. So um, we're going to move to some of those in a second. But before we do, I just wanted to remind people that um, if you do have a question for Larry, then please do send it to me in the chat and we'll try and come to as many of them as possible. And um, so you finished there, Larry, talking about 
um, I guess, rebuilding a new system and a new society out of the kind of ashes of this pandemic. And that's a really pertinent question, uh, pertinent point to end on for one of the questions that we've got come through in the chat. So this chat has come through, this uh, question rather has come through from Kelly. Um, so Kelly's um, asked, is this the right time on the back of the back end of the coronavirus pandemic for drastic social change and a break away from capitalism? And if so, what is a good working alternative that you see to capitalism? Well, <laughs> I've, I've, since I was about 20, I've not talked about capitalism. And I think I, I'm, I'm a bit, although he's done it a little more successfully, Bernard is, is talking about all the things we can do. And I think, yes, this is the, the time on the back for drastic change. Um, the crucial, one of the crucial issues is that business can't do it. There, in this kind of depression, you, nobody will be investing in new businesses, in expanding business. In fact, contraction is going to be the order of the day because in addition to all the people who are out of work and desperate, all the people who depend on the money that those people spend are going to be hurting. Uh, so yes, I think uh, th there is only one force in, the, in the one game to play, and that is government. Uh, the government will have to make the investments. They will have to do the all the work in terms of the Green New Deal and, and, and the CAS services. Um, we could we could then say we have if if we had a government that had transformed the energy system taking it taking bits into not just giving money to companies but but paying for to, if, if a company needs bailing out you bail them out we want to keep them going but we make sure that we take a chunk of that in ownership so we will have government ownership in large areas major elements of the economy that cannot be dealt with by anybody but the government. So I'm not sure whether we'll want to call it socialism. You might, uh, it didn't hurt Bernard that much. You could call it socialism. Brilliant, thanks, Larry. And on that last point around ownership, uh, we've had a number of questions come in specifically around the question of ownership in the healthcare system and the social care system, which is something you touched on um, slightly in your talk. Um, so I wondered if you could speak a little bit to how you understand the role uh, privatisation of the health service, of social care and other public services has played in, um, I guess, uh, undermining the, um, the ability for the health sector to effectively respond to this pandemic. Well, the NHS has been damaged dramatically. I, I can't it's not completely true to say it's mainly privatization. I think about 89% of the NHS, which is a lot of billions, is, has been privatized one way or another. Um, it costs a huge amount of effort to do these uh, constant bids for uh, services and so on that, they're, that, that the NHS organizations end up having to do. So a large chunk of, of the manpower and the woman power and the brain power of the NHS gets tied up in it. Um, the NHS's biggest, bigger problem has been sheer lack of money, resources. We, for one reason or another, sometimes not directly resource related, but long-term resource related, we are short of a massive number of doctors. We're short of a massive number of nurses. We're short of a massive number of care workers. I'll come on to care in a second. And we don't have enough hospitals. Now, the crucial thing that did lead to disaster and the deaths, unnecessary deaths of thousands of people is that shortage of hospital space. Because what, what happened in the NHS, and I don't want to blame people, when you're faced with this kind of crisis and terror, making the right decisions at the right moment is not easy, can't be easy. But they didn't have enough resources to face a new addition to the problems. The hospitals were running at over 90% uh, occupancy when they're supposed to be at 85% its full occupancy. So we had all these people coming down with this terrible illness and the NHS responded by closing down a large chunk of, the, of its work for everybody else who wasn't involved in, in the virus. And part of that was sending people uh, without testing 
not deliberately. They didn't deliberately said how to kill people in the care homes, but they st there was a period of weeks in which people were going from care homes without testing, and inevitably, enough of them had carried the virus, often picked it up in the hospital, into those homes, and we have lost the, the, the numbers vary, I think something like 30,000 people in, in the care homes. Not all from from this, there were other reasons for it. Now, the going over to the care homes and the whole social care system, it is 195% it is privatized or less. It is means tested, heavily. It is needs tested, it means you don't just get a service because you need it. You have to need it desperately to get it. So we haven't had no pre preventive work in social care. So we, the, the privatization of the care system, the defunding of the NHS are probably the two crucial reasons why we couldn't. Plus the idea, you can't get away from it, the ideology of the government. They could have done better if they didn't think that they didn't want to use, that they wouldn't use public services. So I don't know if that's a full answer, but that, that's some of it. No, that's incredibly helpful and, and really illuminating on, on both the privatisation angle and the funding angle. And um, so we've had quite a few questions come in, um, specifically looking at the, the test, track, isolate um, system. And uh, a number of people are asking about, so obviously at the moment, as you said at the start of your talk, you've got this kind of two tier system where you have the, the national system run by Serco and Citel and others, and you have um, some aspects of the system being run by local authorities and public health protection teams and so on. Um, so there's a number of questions that are coming on this issue, but basically the thrust of most of them seems to be, um, what do you think are the, the prospects of um, essentially local authorities just getting on and, and doing an effective uh, test track and isolate system themselves? And they've cited some examples of councils that have already seemed to be doing that, whether it's Sandwell or Blackburn or others across the country. Um, and so whether you think that it'd be feasible for um, for, for something like that to be implemented um, in Oxfordshire? Okay, I don't know if it's feasible. It would be quite expensive. And the, the other side of the fact that they're paying all this money to Serco is they've given very, very little uh, to, the, to the local authorities. I think there was a 10 billion or so set aside. I'm not sure where it's meant to go, but 10 billion from the treasury, 300 million went to local authorities. So it's very all over the whole country. So there's very little money there. On the other hand, it is true that some local authorities have patched together, using more intelligence than money, volunteers often, to, a way to improve the system. Not to necessarily uh, replace it, because I think we can't. Uh, because there are problems even in getting the data. Who, who, not everybody gets the data, even, even the local Public health protection teams don't get the data in time. They get it a, a day or two late, which makes it very difficult for them. So I'm not sure you can take it over, but local authorities could do an awful lot. The crucial thing, I think, the more I look at it, is you've got to get people into the system. There are increasing amount of capacity for, for testing, but it doesn't happen unless somebody is known to be in the system. And that can be done by all sorts of people. Uh, councils, local councils can certainly do that. The NHS GPs can certainly do that. Begin to get people into the system, informing them of the possibility of, of help and of testing and getting them tested. And once they're tested, then you have to have people following up. I think, I haven't got a clear idea. I think we could do more outside the, the government money. I don't begin to think we could do a full system because it's very big. There are tens of thousands of employees uh, that would be needed, but some of it could be done by volunteers. Uh, so please ask me a question. To, 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 I, I'm aware that that was a bit wrong. No, not at all, Larry. That's really good. And um, we've got a few more questions coming in, but I just wanted to remind everyone, if you do have questions that you want asked, then to pop them in the chat and we'll try and get to them. Um, so obviously when you were talking, uh, earlier, Larry, you were talking about the kind of economic impacts of the, the pandemic and the, I guess, the, both the economic and the social impacts in terms of unemployment, in terms of the, the kind of uh, the, the way in which the economy is in kind of 
collapse and free fall at the moment and the impact that has on people's lives. And um, we've had quite a few questions in coming in from Laura and from Kelly and others, which are specifically asking about what would be a better response to that economic crisis and specifically to, um, to the social impacts of that. Um, and people are asking specifically um, about whether you think a, a universal basic income is something that should be implemented to, to manage, um, I guess, the social impacts of the, the economic um, implications of the, of the pandemic. Uh, I, I have to confess that it's a question I don't know the answer. I don't know what my answer is even. Uh, universal benefit is, basic income is a marvelous idea. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily financially impossible. Uh, there seems to be, among people like, like I suppose most of us, there is a debate between the best way to have full employment is to have UBI, which means not everybody is employed, but everybody has an income, or whether you should have a job guarantee, which says that everybody wants a job, can have a job at a, a reasonable living, at a living wage, employed by the government to do useful things. Uh, in a way, I think it's, I'm not usually wishy-washy, but I think probably we, we could use both. We could have a, a, a you know, the, the great thing with the universal basic income is it doesn't ask anybody any questions. If your problem is, if you've got problems with your mental health and you can't quite get it together to go to work every day, great, fine, take the money, do, what, do what's easy and best for you get yourself unstressed. If you're looking after your relatives, great, fine. If you just like lying around all day, terrific, uh, and so on. So I think a lot of people like work. Most of us don't have the ingenuity and discipline to provide our own daily uh, framework. Um, so so this guaranteed job, in, so, my answer is what nobody else is saying, because there's a great debate, as I say, bit, a bit of debate, uh, unfortunately, between the UBI and, and job guarantee. And I say that if we put both into, put into place, we would have income for everybody, and we would have work for everybody who wants it, and we would have to, which is the, and we would get the benefits of that work in, every, in, in all directions. So yes, we, we, we could do that. Excellent. Thanks, Larry. Um, so going to move on to, I guess, like something <clears throat> slightly broader, which is around, I guess, we've talked a lot about the impacts of the pandemic and and some of the things that you'd like to, to see kind of happen instead of what the government's current policies are and some of what would be, I guess, a more just and equitable response. Um, but there's some questions coming in around what do you think the prospects are of, um, you know, as, as people say, us building back better out of this crisis, given, you know, the current government, um, given the centralisation of power in Westminster? Um, what do you think are the prospects of us being able to kind of achieve the kind of social and environmental and economic transformation that we've talked about so far? Well, I, I think it's the, ch the odds are against us. I think, I think the ideology across the board, we see that it, it's ended even the Green Party, this fear about debt. We have had this, this ideology of, of the government is bad, debt is bad, this government is not just useless, it's a problem, and so on. So, and, and, and most people, we, we understand how difficult it is if, in our individual circumstances if we run into debt uh, and that it can destroy a family. Uh, we didn't learn that governments are quite different from households that in the sense that governments create all the money um, and that's different and you're not supposed to do that at home. So I, I think that the government will fail. I think that they will uh, not do, extend the, uh, the payments that they've been making to, to scheduled to end on October 31st. I don't know if they'll go a little longer. I don't think they'll go long enough. I think millions of people will fall out of 
in payment and, as well as work. Um, and I think, uh, I don't know is, is the answer. I think there'll be enormous, I try to imagine it, but the chaos and anger that will, that, that I think are likely now, I, I've been wrong once or twice before, so I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but but my my own estimate is that we're heading for a, a disaster. And I guess a follow on from that <clears throat> is if if that's what we're if that's your kind of sense of what to expect from the national picture and the national government. What do you think um, the local campaigners or councillors or the council as a whole in Oxfordshire and Oxford City Council could be doing to, I guess, mitigate um, the worst effects of, of, of the crisis? I think I, we, we need to be talking to each other much more. I think most people are quite confused about what's happening and why things, why Britain seems to have done so badly. Um, and I think they're quite willing to give the government quite a lot of room, um, if only because it's hard to understand what's happening. Um, so I think the councils, I mean, we always wanted to, want to do it and don't always do it well. We need to talk to people and say, we think that there could be a crisis coming. We think, we, we first of all, we, to, to re-emphasize, that all the things that we're told to do, we should do. The distancing is real uh, and, and the masks are real and, and the rest of that, we need to do that. And people, uh, there's uh, councils and, and political annual people have got some respect, not, we don't get total respect, but we have got some, some trust and uh, people will listen. So I think we need to say that. I think we need to say to people, look, we, we are fearful, we want, we think the government should continue paying people as long as it's necessary. We don't think anybody should fall into destitution. That's our bottom line. We don't want that. We are not all in it together, but we are all humans and we all want to at least avoid disaster. And we can avoid disaster. So I think we want to tell people things could get very bad, that it's not necessary. It's a mistake. The government is making a mistake. And it's not a, it's the best democracy in the world. Not many of them are. But in the, in the end, we will change it. In the end, the unfortunate part is what happens between now and the end. I think in the end, we will come up with a solution. We will not be able to be so destructive to our fellow people. So I think we need to say things like that to people get the conversation going. Uh, the truth is that most people are not all that different in their views, but a lot of people are different in the information they've had about those views, what, what can be done. A lot of people think the government can't do things, and, and I think we can do things. Uh, but we can talk to those people and say, look, if it gets to it, we'll be with you and we would like you to be with us. Thanks, Larry. That's a, a really positive and hopeful note at the end of that. And I guess um, there's some people who've been asking specifically about the, I guess, the way that the crisis and the pandemic has impacted on how we as a society interact with each other. So obviously it's had some really clear things in the fact that we're talking over the computers right now when we all live around the corner from each other and we could be in a space together and speaking to each other. Um, but there's something, some, some more kind of subtle things that I think people have been picking up on um, that has um, really come to light from the, the, the pandemic in that, you know, we saw um, for several weeks, the kind of outpouring of, of love and care for the NHS and for the, the workers and the staff that, um, not just in the NHS, but um, key workers more generally, including, you know, the lowest paid people in society, um, you know, shelf stackers and cleaners and so on, who are, who are I guess, on the front lines of this pandemic. Um, and we've also seen, I guess, uh, the, the popping up of things like mutual aid groups and, you know, community spirit that has, um, really uh, kind of emerged in the aftermath of, of, of a really troubling and trying time. And I wonder whether you think that um, what you were saying there about 
you know, um, we, we will get there eventually and we will, um, you know, we will, we, 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 we will be able to bring people together on these issues. Do you think that the one of the impacts of this pandemic is that it has brought people and communities um, closer together and has um, revealed the kind of cracks in the in the failing system that um, that is a I guess a a place in which we can build a, a kind of new and fu better future from? Yes I, I think there is something to that. Um, I, I can't tell you I've had much per first hand because I've been very heavily isolating. So. So my first hand seeing with people is, is less than, than usual. Uh, I, I, it is, we, we have absorbed the idea that people who don't make a lot of money must be useless or very nearly, they get what they're, they get what they're, what they, they're worth. That's, that's a key element of, of, of uh, market economy idea. Everybody gets what so these guys that get tens of millions must be really great. And people who get the minimum wage must be pretty useless, because that's you get what. And of course, it's never been true. Um, and 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 it is something that I think a lot more people have become aware of. Uh, and when we look at the at the death toll, of, of course, uh, the system has been kept running. We didn't shut down. A lot of people managed to work at home, and a lot of people have managed to, you know, to protect themselves and fine, great, that's what you have to do. But a lot of people, the, the bus drivers, death rate, and shop workers, death rate, and construct all sorts of strange things because we don't, didn't have, when the categories were established, they weren't established to deal with the pandemic. But it looks like factory workers have done very, have, have uh, and I think what's happened is people have been forced into work and the factories are not set up there was a, quite a bit of stuff in, in the Daily Mail, in the Oxford Mail about the, uh, the BMW plant, uh, where there was a, a, spade, a spike at one point, and people writing in and saying, I can't give you my name, but it's not just one spike. There's no way you can avoid being too close to people in the plant. It's not the way it works. The plant said, oh, we've got everything beautifully organized. It's scientifically established. I, I tend to believe the in anonymous uh, workers who wrote in. Uh, so I think that that's run through it all. We have a greater awareness of how important each of us are, uh, regardless of how much we're, we're getting paid or not paid. Um, but it didn't stop us putting people on the line and and not and neglecting, not noticing, which is which. You know, we, we're very good at that. So I don't, it, it's, um, I think people have learned a lot, but I'm not sure it's enough to, to change, that that in itself will change things. I think it's when, when the shit hits the fan, it, it, it'll be the pain that'll get people moving rather than the affection. Not that the affection's in there. Great, thank you, Larry. Um, so, we're coming to the point where there are very few questions left in the chat. So I'm going to wait a couple of moments to see if there's anything um, that anyone has been dying to say um, and ask Larry. But um, in the meantime, I've got um, one question from me, which is um, quite straightforward, um, which is in this current context, what gives you hope? Uh, I hope uh, that they will the, the government will get pummeled for, for the failures of it of the tra trade and track system they've set up. They have, and they promised two days ago that they were going to send some of the circle people to the local authorities, and it seems like today they changed their minds. Uh, so I am hopeful that, that as we build up, the pressures build up on them, they have changed things. They brought McKinsey in to examine, to review the the process. Now that has to be good. I'm being sarcastic, but they they are aware that it's a disaster looming. So I think it is, and, and we've had the advantage of this very valuable group, the Independent Sage. Uh, so we're not lacking in, in expertise on, on our side. Um, so I am hopeful, and, it, and that's the crucial thing. Once the pandemic is licked, which we get it going down steadily to a small enough number, 
then we can open up safely. Then all the, then we get back to the old politics. Why shouldn't we do things, good things with all our work instead of just making profits for a few people? Um, so I think uh, the, the crucial thing is obviously is, is to get past the, the, the pandemic. And I think we will get past that, but I fear we will get past it with a lot of people having been ill. And, and as we're learning, it's not just that you die, but the thousands of people are going to have long-term serious illnesses as a result. And then, of course, we're going to run into a, a period of, I think, of, of um, this kind of mass poverty, which is going to have other effects before we sort that out. But I, I don't know. I think there might be a green government at the end. Excellent. That's what we like to hear. Um, so I'm going to take one final question and it's on a, um, a slightly different topic, um, but um, still tangentially related. Um, so what do you think the impact of the COVID pandemic will be on the US election? Um, and uh, we have to ask you these questions. Uh, and who, who, who do you think will win uh, the US election in November? Well, I think that the, the one good thing that will come out of this pandemic, or maybe more will come, but I think it will destroy Trump. Because things in America, they, for whatever reason, our death rate is worse here in the UK still than in America. Um, but, but everything else there is going to, down the tubes. And, uh, and they will have the same problems. Then the, the, the Republicans are not uh, backing the, the bill that the House of Representatives passed quite a big a bill for uh, putting pe money into people's pockets, quite a substantial amounts. Um, and, and Trump has come up with, 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 with a very shoddy kind of makeshift that doesn't cover nearly what needs to be covered. So there will be the same, what I've been talking about here will be there with spades people uh, without food and without a health service, of course, to start with for millions of people. Um, so I think there will be disaster and, and the death rates will rise. And I don't think people can, it will ignore, I mean, large numbers of people will see who's to blame. So I think it has finished uh, Trump off. I think Biden will be elected. Then we can start working on him because <laughs> he's not a perfect, uh, candidate. I think that's a brilliant note to end it on, the prospect of Donald Trump being kicked out of office and <laughs> obviously it's sad that it's uh, Joe Biden rather than Bernie but um, but of course um, anything's better than Trump. Um, so thank you so much Larry um, for talking and answering these questions. I found it incredibly insightful and um, I've learned a huge amount. Um, I'm now going to just quickly pass over to Dick um, to uh, wrap up a little bit and tell you about what's coming next before we let you all go and enjoy your evenings. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, um, well, as part of this whole picture is, I mean, issues of democracy have been lumbering around underneath all of this because you've got a, a very centralized government, you know, responding to the crisis in a Churchillian way and taking control and failing. Um, but actually there are other movements afoot. I mean, not, it's not so long since we had uh, uh, an attempt at the Citizens' Assembly in the city, looking at the climate uh, change thing um, as an interesting experiment. Um, you know, we could be discussing that when we meet next on the 16th of September. Um, there are big questions about the way in which decisions are made and how power is distributed. And it may be that part of the Build Back Better um, throws that a little bit into the mix. So I think 16th of September is probably not a bad time to be thinking about um, how power is distributed now that we've seen the way it can be misapplied. Um, and let's not begin talking about the House of Lords. So 16th of September um, is the next one, 7.30, and it will be great to see you there. Um, I'm going to conclude and throw back to Chris just to finish off briefly and to say that this has been the fourth in a series of meetings. Uh, we had uh, Kate Rayworth talking about donut, donut economics. We had Chris Goodall talking about um, 
uh, zero carbon futures and holding out great hope for that. We had a session on very locally on the St Mary's and par parts of the neighbouring wards, local uh, um, neighbor, local neighbourhood, oh, I'm losing my plot here, LTN, local trans, um, transport no traffic neighbourhoods. Thank you, Craig, thank you. <laughs> I bet it's been a long day. Uh, low, yeah, low traffic neighbourhood for St Mary's. That was a very locally focused one. Uh, and then we've had this one looking both local and national. And all of those are going to be available. They've been recorded. They're available on YouTube. And I think, Chris, you're going to... Chris is, oh, uh, Rosie are our comms people. They know how all the technology works. So they'll be able to send out a link, I think. Chris, I'm going to hand over to Chris. He'll tell you how he's going to do that. So that you can catch up on those meetings if you missed them. How you can look at this one again and how you can tune in to the next one that's coming. So over to you, Chris, and just tell us how that's gonna work. Yeah, absolutely, thanks, Dick. So <clears throat> um, obviously you all signed up for this event on Eventbrite, so you'll get an email um, with uh, a link to this talk that you can share with your friends and family and, and kind of spread the word. Um, we will also get a link to the next talk, but um, before you all leave, I'm just going to quickly pop that in the chat so that you can see it right away. So. Um, as Dick said, that um, event's going to be on the 16th of September and if you click that link in the chat, you can register for that straight away and make sure that you get a place. There's a few final things that I wanted to um, post in the chat for you now before um, letting you all go and enjoy your weekends. Um, the first of this is, so obviously we've had um, just shy of 40 people on this call, which has been incredible and we're really grateful to have so many um, people here. But we really want to reach more and more people with these events. Um, so the link that I'm just popping in the chat now um, is for those of you who are on Twitter, if you click on that link, um, what it will do is it will give you a pre-filled tweet, which basically will just say, I just had the most amazing talk um, from Larry Sanders. Uh, there's another incredible event coming up with a Not Democracy register now. That will get the um, event in front of more people and uh, make sure that you can reach as many people as possible and reach more and more people in these difficult times because obviously it is, it is hard for us to... Um, reach people when we are um, stuck indoors all the time. The final thing I just want to give you is um, if you do want to keep up to date with all the things that myself, uh, Rosie, Dick and Craig are organising as part of this programme events, but in terms of our wider work and campaigning, you can um, always stay in touch and stay up to date with what we're doing by just following us on social media. So there's a list of links in the chat there. If you click on those links, you'll be able to follow us and keep in touch. That is all from me. Um, the only thing I have left to say is a massive, massive thank you to Larry for giving up um, so much of his time and knowledge and experience and insight. Um, and of course, a massive, massive thank you to every single one of you for attending this evening and giving up a part of your Friday evening um, to discuss how we build a better Oxford and a better world. Um, that's all from me and I hope you have a lovely weekend and hope to see you at the next event. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.